Yeah? OK, cool. Um, they're recording this, so I need the go ahead from the recording. You guys good? Yeah? OK, cool. So yeah, my name is Daniel Caldwell. I work with Amigo Cloud. I'm the director of GIS there. And um, this talk is using PostGIS to power offline mobile mapping and open data. We heavily use PostGIS and Amigo Cloud, and I wanted to share with you today um, how we can use it and how uh, you can use Amigo Cloud to get better at PostGIS queries. Um, how many people here use PostGIS on a regular basis? How many of you have actually installed Postgres onto a server? How many of you have installed PostGIS onto the server? OK, cool. So there's a good amount of you. So I went through that for the first time a couple of years ago. That was rather difficult. And I'm sure some people here have encountered that as well. And using Amigo Cloud, you can make that a lot easier. <clears throat> so whenever you run into any GIS system, um, you're basically doing three major things. You're going to collect data, you're going to analyze that data, and then you're going to share that data out. Um, the whole point is, in the end, to be able to basically figure out what secrets this data is holding and reveal those to a person in a meaningful way. Usually this means through charts, through maps, and through sharing that data out, depending on what your role is. Um, it's, important to, to, um, it's important to take into account that each one of these are distinct. And in large organizations, these can be done by different people. The person who's out there on the street collecting the data is not the person who's analyzing it, who is not the cartographer who is sharing it out. Um, however, as we move towards cloud platforms and as we move away from the desktop, um, that's getting muddled. The ability to go grab a template, a CSS, uh, Cardo CSS style, put that into MapNIC, um, and then generate a map off of some open data that you, you grabbed from a government's website um, is becoming a lot more easy. A lot, a lot more easy. A lot easier. So where does PostGIS fit into this? PostGIS and other open source tools are basically the glue that puts this together. Um, if you didn't have PostGIS, if you were shuffling around shape files, if you were shuffling around coverages, life would be a lot harder. Um, in an organization where you're trying to manage many, many people, you're not going to be able to say, here's a shape file for you, and here's a shape file for you, and here's one for you. No, you have to have an enterprise database in order to be able to collect data with multiple people and be able to share that data amongst your organization. Um, so PostGIS allows you to gather your data there, allows you to analyze it with the, the GIS functionality that it has, <clears throat> and allows you to share that out using, a ver uh, using various tools as well. So how do you get data into PostGIS? The main way of getting data into PostGIS is by using something like GDAL or OGR. To GDAL is the, the geospatial data abstraction layer. It's a suite of open source tools that are able to read in various formats. And they can all import those formats. So you can take your shape file, and you can take your KML file, and you can take your, your file geodatabase, and you can bring them all into your PostGIS database. Um, what we've done in Amigo Cloud is we've also enhanced this some more. Um, and we created a web server um, in Python, actually, that can receive requests from our endpoints that will turn those requests into SQL and then dump that into the PostGIS database. In all instances, everything comes down to SQL being dumped in, being used to dump data into or get data out of the geo database or the PostGIS database. Um, how do you get data out? Well, getting data out is really simple. It just depends on what you want. If you need a visual representation of your data, like a map, a slippy map of, of some sort, you can use Map Server or MapNIC. You then use a tile cache so that you can save server resources, and you can serve those tiles up to your clients. Pretty simple stuff. Um, it gets more complex when you actually have to create a MapNIC file and a Cardo CSS file um, in order to, to generate a good visual representation. Another way of getting data out is um, for open data sharing. That's using GDAL OGR to simply rip your data out of the database. Say, give me this everything that is in this table, and I want it in a file geodatabase, or I want it in a shape file, and I'm going to put this on an FTP server in order to share out to people. You see this all the time with government organizations. You'll go to their websites, and there'll be an FTP server, and it'll have shape files, and it'll have zipped up coverages, and, and a whole bunch of formats. Um, quite often, you'll find shape files and KMLs are really common. Um, every now and then, you'll also see CSVs, which can be quite useful as well. 
And then what we did with Amiga Cloud is we also furthered our, um, our web server. We basically can, can use a REST endpoint to query the database um, and extract data out using queries. So I can say, select this where blah, 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 and it's going to give me that subset of data. And it encapsulates that data into some JSON and returns it to the client, which then, and then can render the JSON to the user. So putting these two methods together of putting data into, um, into the PostGIS database and taking it out, you can get into this iterative cycle, which you call a geo workflow, right? You're going to be able to say, here's my data, here's all of a big dump of my data, and then you're going to be able to query it over and over again. You're going to be able to say, I want to buffer this, I want to intersect that, and I'm going to be able to extract out some information that I want from the data, and then you'll be able to share that data out to the world. Does this make any sense? Does this make sense? OK. Um, so I'm really big on not big on slides. I'm more big on showing people how the software works. And so we're going to go through um, these main workflows. One is offline mobile mapping. And two, it will be analyzing some data. And three, we're going to share that data out really quickly. So let's get, let's get to the fun stuff. So this is Amigo Cloud's user dashboard. And I can come in here and create a new project. And so what's going on when I'm creating this project? It takes a little while. And the reason why it takes a while is that in the back end, it's actually creating a Postgres database. And then it's installing PostGIS into that database. It creates a few data sets that are used to track um, user information and things like that. But um, in the end, it's very, very simple just to create a database. Once you have uh, your database or your project created, you can then upload your data there. Here I have some, um, some data. This is a zipped up file geodatabase from some data in San Diego. Okay, so the file's uploaded, and what is it doing now? Well, it unzips that file, and it's using OGR to OGR. To, a, in, to do an inspection of all of the data in there. It's saying, what data sets are in this geodatabase? What can I put into my Postgres database? And, and it just iterates through all of them and creating them, giving them a default symbology. So the real power here is we're seeing several different things happen at the same time. Um, we see the visual representation being generated using Mapnik. Um, we also can, can query the data. Um, individual records. This is going to be submitting a uh, little JSON blob that contains the SQL query that we need to um, the web server, which then submits it to the PostGIS database, brings back the data as a JSON blob, which is then displayed to the user here. Right? This is so much easier than opening up a terminal and connecting to Postgres and, and doing the SQL query manually and seeing everything in binary te or in text, um, and then trying to make some kind of judgment off, off of what you did, if what you did is correct or not. Um, so here, we have the parcels data set. And this is already synced to my mobile device. So let me bring that up really quick. OK. And it's a little crooked, because we don't all want to have our heads tilted. All right. So here's the mobile device, and this is doing the exact same thing. What it's doing here is it's querying the project using the REST endpoint, which then queries the data database. It tells it, it does the simple query, you know, um, do a describe on all the tables, tell me what data sets are there, bundles that in JSON, and sends it back to the client, right? Client then can loop through those, and it can, you know, say, give me the data for this one. I need all of the records this time, right? Um, when it does that, it downloads them to the phone, and it, all of the data is then replicated to the phone here. So here I have my parcels data set that is the same as the data set here on my, um, on my desktop. And you can zoom in, and we can add new records. Weird looking parcel. 
And what it did is it submitted the data set, it, the, that record locally, it stored it locally, and then it is syncing that to the server. How does it sync to the server? Well, it does a simple little insert with one row. Insert such and such and such and such with this shape to this data set, gets sent in the JSON to the SQL, gets put into your Postgres database, and then it gets replicated back out. Um, and then you can see that it's already here um, on the server. So the server has already received this PostJS. What happens when you go offline with this in this system is, you can come here, try and tap on it. Oh, sorry, settings, turn offline mode. Um, so in offline mode, we can still go and create new records. But this time, it's not going to sync to the server immediately because it's offline. So how can it do this? This is the power of using a, a database like PostGIS and, and, and Postgres. Um, it doesn't matter if you're sending out data or you're sending out data or you're sending out data. We're not shifting files back and forth. I'm not dumping the shapefile onto this database or onto this mobile device. And I'm not s sending that shapefile to you. We all have the same database that we're working with. So that means that you can send a particular record, and you can send a particular record, and you can send a particular record, and the database will handle all of the different users um, interacting with that at the same time. And then when it syncs back to each individual record, you're not getting a whole copy of the data every time. You just get the changes that have happened next time, or from the last time. And it may be 10 people have submitted 10 changes, or one person has submitted 50 changes, but you can track which changes are submitted by which person, and you can only apply those changes. And so here we have on my mobile device is a, a change that is on this device but is not on the server yet. And then if we go back online, um, settings, right, it's going to perform a sync back to the server, and it'll insert the, the record there at that time. So this is the power of having a, a database in your back end rather than files. It's the power of being able to have a multi-user system. Um, it's the power of having, um, being able to leverage not only the REST endpoints and the, the JSON and being able to do individual queries, being able to extract the data out in a tabular format and be able to look at it in a visual format so you get instant feedback of what you've actually done. So, this is all nice and everything, but this is the first stage. This is getting data into your PostGIS database. Now we need to move to the next stage, and that's the fun, what I think is fun part. Getting data in and going out and collecting, collecting data can be fun. If you're out and collecting interesting data in interesting places, I would totally be up to go collect some data in Yosemite. Um, then you're going to have a good time. If you're out collecting data in the middle of the city that you live everywhere, and this is not, not so much fun. So. What you can come do here is come here and create queries against your database. It seems the network has slowed down dramatically. We're going to select all of my sewer mains. So anybody who's familiar with PostJS um, is familiar with using SQL, right? It's not the most user-friendly thing, but it's actually really powerful and allows you to, com to complete your geo workflow. So here I've just selected all of my um, sewer mains from San Diego's downtown area and returns them all in a tabular format, also generates the MapNIC, so I get my visual format. Next, we can actually do some work here. So let's select all of the all of the things where the size is um, six inches. So many times um, you'll go to a city and you'll be in a really, really new, new uh, apartment or a new hotel and everything's great and everything, and then you find out that you know something simple like There'll be all these little signs on the mirror that say things like, don't flush, blah, 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 down the toilet, right? And that's because this new hotel or whatever is hooked up to a sewer system that was built 150 years prior, right? And they can't handle that kind of sewage. So what happens is 
if you're in a city and you need to plan, say, we need to replace all of these old six inch pipes with new 12 inch pipes, um, how, do I, how would you figure that out? Well, this is a really simple query that shows you where they are. Um, but you can also do some really cool stuff with uh, PostGIS. You can also do, say, say you're the contractor and you want to know how much pipe to get. You can do ST length. Um, data set 16550. And say, give me all the lengths of all the pipes. Execute. And then that's cool. And then you can sum that up. Execute that. So that's great. It says, I need 0 0.02737759 length of pipe. This, of course, is useless to us because this number is in decimal degrees. However, post GIS to the rescue again, we can just convert the geometry into meters. So doing that, you can do that using uh, ST or using um, geography. Graphy. And then let me make sure this. Execute it, and now we have our number in meters. And we actually need 2,936 meters, not decimal degrees, because we all think in meters. Um, you could actually do some more multiplication to turn that into feet and whatnot. And then if you're a contractor, you would actually get an extra 293 feet, because you always have to add 10% to the amount of materials you need. So um, so you can save your queries out. Um, so you can recall them later. So this is one simple workflow that we have um, using geographies, using ST length, using sum. Now, this is not really that unique. You can calculate, usually calculate this data. Many times you get a database that has geometries in it, and if they came from, from some sources, it'll have the length of all your features. You'll see a length, and you'll see an area field, and you can just do the sum off of that. And so you're like, why, why is this powerful? And like, A, it's powerful because it's using the geometry, but you can also do even more powerful things with it. So here, uh, we'll go back here. So we have our query, and we're going to create another query. So in this query, we're going to do select star from our coordinary faults. These right here are little fault lines that run through downtown San Diego. Um, I knew fault lines ran through downtown San Diego. They run all the way through California. And I was kind of curious as to which ones were downtown. Um, because I go down here. I'm from Southern California. And I go down to San Diego. And, and if you were buying property there, you would want to know, you know where the fault lines are. Is this place an earthquake zone or not? So. We can select them all. We can see them. That's great. And, but we can also check which parcels that they are going to intersect. So we can do that using ST intersects. Um, and to do that, we're going to just select all the parcel data. Parcels dot star from our earthquake and our parcel data set. ST intersects. One, six, five, four, six. And then data set one, six, five, four, seven. And we to your right, execute that. So right here, this is all these are all the parcels that are intersecting our fault lines. Now that's pretty useful, except it doesn't look real, right? If you're going to buy a parcel and you're standing right here and your fault line is right there, you would still want to know about it, right? You want to know about all the parcels that are within a certain distance. So we can do that again um, by adding in a simple buffer. Um, yeah, more sticks. So for that, we're going to buffer our actually we're going to make it a little bit more visual here. We're going to 
buffer the coordinary faults. And we need to give it a bus for distance. And there's our buffer distance. Now this distance right here is in decimal degrees again, which is not really useful. So let's turn that back into um, meters. So we do geography. And then we buffer by, oops, buffer by 100 meters, maybe 150 meters. And then we turn that back into a geometry. We need to turn it back into a geometry so it will show on the map correctly. If, the, if, you, try to red, if you were to try to render something in meters on this map, it would be off the, off the face of the world. Because in coordinate systems, you have negative 180 to 180, 0 to 360, um, or 0 to 90, depending on which coordinate system. And this one is negative 180 to 180, and negative 90 to positive 90. And your meters would be like, you know, 553, which is, you know, it's like wrap around the world 50 times, and then it'll be someplace you have no idea. So that gives us a much better buffer right there. And we know exactly what length it is. So we can save this. Uh, and so we can save this query buffer faults. So we can come back to it later. And we can also create another data set. Um, lines. So what is it doing when I create a data set here? Well, it's really simple. It's going in to PostGIS and, and Postgres and saying, create table where blah, 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 blah. And it does a, a selection of the data that you have asked for in the query and uses that to generate a table all on the down, all on the back end. You don't have to open up a, you know, you don't have to like extract your data out and then use OGR to bring it back in. You have a question? Sorry, I was just wondering if that data set would be updated every time you have any new data. I guess in this, uh, this buffer? No, it won't be updated. You'd have to run this again, um, which is why we like to save the queries out because um, you can just easily delete it, go back to the query, re execute, and, and create a new data set. Um, so that, that's a, we have that, that's a good idea. We're working on that. Um, so here, I've created a new uh, buffered fault lines. So yeah, you don't have to extract your data out, you don't have to, to get in, you don't have to do a copy table, you don't have to open up a, a, a command line uh, in order to do this. You can just do it here in the interface and it's gonna do it for you. So now that we have our buffered fault lines, it makes it a lot easier to write the other query. Um, a, we can actually see visually uh, what we are, we can, we can see over here visually what we're looking at and what the buffer is to make sure that we have the right amount. Um, and then you can run that intersect <coughs> query again. Uh, let's see, browse data sets. We want to know what parcels we're in SX. Star from, and then select the parcels. And select our new buffered fault lines where intersects data set select it here buffer fault lines wkb geometry wkb geometry is the default field name used for shape fields when you use ogr to ogr that's why i know it's named that and <coughs> parcels wkb Um, five, four, six, five, four, six, five, four, six, five, six, five. Ah, my bad. I made a mistake. I thought I would. In this query, I didn't actually give it a field name, so as WKP geometry. Execute that. And then we create another permanent data set, and we'll name it buffered faults2. Save that. All right, now we can get back to what we were doing. Sorry. Parcels.star. I want to know all my parcels 
from my parcels data set and my buffered faults where st intersects. And then I'm going to say my buffered faults 2.wkb geometry and my parcels geometry. What? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Execute. So now I'll execute, and this tells me an actual more realistic number of what we need to, in order to be able to generate um, the data that we want. So once again, we're just, we're, what we've done here is we have data. We know it tells a story. We want to go figure out what that story is. The story here is I want to know what parcels are within a certain distance of uh, my earthquake faults. And then I can save this out as another one. I'm going to name it Earthquake Warning on Parcels. OK. So now that my data is saved, now that I've actually been able to get some information out of the data, out of the data, we can work into the third part. And the third part is sharing that data out. So we go back to our data sets. We see that we have our new data sets here. And let's say I wanted to go into my earthquake warning parcels. And let's say, for example, I'm an earthquake salesperson. And I am going to go try and sell insurance, earthquake insurance to the parcels. But I only want to sell insurance to people who actually have money to pay for it. So I want to know which ones of these parcels are worth the most. So I can go to Show Styling Options. And I can choose a chloropleth map. And we can do um, ASR total. ASR total happens to be the um, assessment total for the total land value for that property. Um, and then we'll choose seven buckets, because I think it looks better. And then we'll click Save. And so this tells me which ones are the most expensive properties. So if I'm going to be an uh, insurance salesman who wants to go shell earthquake insurance to the people, I can say, you know what? Your property is within 100 meters of a fault line. It's right over there. And here's a great map. And I know you have money to buy insurance. So would you like to buy some? <laughs> so. Um, once again, this is a story that we can find, right? There's information in this data, but it's kind of locked in that data. And you want to extract that data, that information out. And so we want to share this out with people. Um, so there's a couple of ways. There's two main ways to share this out, right? The first way is to share it out visually. Um, in Amigo Cloud, you click public map here, and that gives you a link. And this link allows you to share out this, this data set map here. I can come here, and we're going to choose satellite. Should load. You go satellite. There it comes. Network. Everybody's like sending emails at the same time. You're bogging down the network. OK. And then once you have the link, you can then share that with people. So if I were a different user, and somebody gives, sends me this link in the email saying, we should go visit all of these people, they're going to be able to download the same map that I, I have. Um, so that's way number one. Way number two is to sh actually share the data out. And this is for government organizations and nonprofits and, and people like that. They need to be able to um, basically have, create an open data portal to share the data out. Um, to do that, we go down here to data sharing. And we click Share Data Sets. And here, let's see, we'll select Buffered Faults 2 and the Buffered Fault Lines and the Faults. And that looks good. Click OK. And then we're going to name this Earthquake Data, Earthquake Warning Data. And click Done. And then we click Save and Share, and we get a link. And then this can be shared out on your public website. Oh, we need an incognito window. And your visitors will see this. 
Okay. So this shows us the outline of the data that we've shown and allows the user to pick whatever format they want to download this in. So this is really nice and easy for the users who are going to come here because they can get the information in the, in the data format that they want it in. Um, they can then use that in their own GIS or, or their own GIS systems um, however they, they wish to. So for example, we can come here and we can download this one as a KML. And they're going to get an email because sometimes it takes a little while. Uh, too many buttons. Click OK. And in a few minutes, the, there's going to be an email for that telling me that I can download it. Oh, it's my incognito window. So I'm not going to be typing in my password right now. Here's my export file. I can click here to download it. And it's downloaded it and put it on my machine. And then they can open it up in their own system. Here, my KMLs are set to open up in Google Earth. I don't need to see tips. I know what I'm doing. And there's your data. So. This allows, so using PostGIS as a central repository and the other open source tools that allows, allow you to access it, you can easily come in, you can import your data in using OGR to, o, or using OGR, to OGR and GDAL. You can then use PostGIS's queries to analyze your data, reveal the stories that they have to tell. Then you can use the other tools to extract your data out. You can visually extract out your data using MapNIC or MapServer from your PostGIS database. And in the end, you get a pretty slick system that allows you to, to complete your geo workflows online. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's all I had. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, you first. How does your mobile app work uh, going in and out of data service, not manually going offline? But It'll detect that there's no network app access at the time, and everything will be stored offline. Yeah, yeah. Normally when I go offline, I don't put it into offline mode. Um, offline mode is good for people who know they're going to go offline and don't want to use their data um, plan. Um, but normally I would put it in airplane mode, but this is a demo, and I didn't want to disconnect from the network and not get reconnected because everybody here is connected. So, um, yes? Uh, on the on here, on the device, we're using a SQL uh, SQLite database. Um, so it's stored in a database there too, and then we actually render it using OpenGL, um, which gives us pretty good performance rendering large amount of data. So, yes. I was just curious how you do the delta calculation from the database to the parts. Okay, so the change sets are kind of complex, and. Um, we will know which change sets are coming from which client because every user is logged into the system and authenticated. Um, and it's basically uh, you know, last person in. So if I were to change a record and you were to change a record and yours got synced and then mine got synced, mine's going to sync over yours. However, the change sets only contain change information. So I can say the shape changed or the field changed or both of them changed. So if you change the field and I change the geometry, you're going to see my geometry and you'll see your field. Does that make sense? So each change set has a subset of that change information. We also keep track of what the previous information was and the old, like the old information and the new one. So if you want to, you can go in the API, you can visit through all the change sets that have been applied to that data set and find out who did what and when and what they changed. So, um, yes, in the back? Do you have related table editing cooked into the mobile app? Yes, we have related table editing cooked into the mobile app. Uh, any other questions? No? OK, cool. We have two minutes left, so I think that was, oh, one more. How much is that uh, footprint is put in by Android? How much is the footprint? It's too easy requirement. Uh, for the mobile device? Yeah. It depends on your data. You download a lot of data to it, it's going to be a lot bigger. Um, you know. Yeah, we don't have restrictions. It, it's, you're mainly restricted on what your mobile di device can handle. When it comes to rendering numbers of records, we can handle upwards of 150,000 points without an issue and 20,000 polygons, but it depends. You, you put the coastline of Alaska with a million vertices, obviously your phone's going to crawl trying to draw that. It'll still try, but it'll crawl. 
All right. So, all right. I think we're done. Thank you very much, everybody.